Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. This is such a great occasion. I'm Ann Cudd, and as the provost of the university, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture, formally marking Dr. C.B. Bhattacharya's appointment as the H.J. Zoffer Chair in Sustainability and Ethics. As a university, our most important contributions come through the work of our faculty. At the University of Pittsburgh, we're fortunate to have a very strong faculty that regularly makes meaningful contributions to advancing knowledge and increasing understanding, creativity, and discovery. Each member of our faculty is expected to and does make these contributions. But even within this outstanding group, there are those who make exceptional contributions. They ask new questions, open new avenues of thought, and make us look at the world in new ways. For these individuals, whose accomplishments and contributions are well beyond the authoritative knowledge, stature, and service expected of a full professor, the university can recognize the contributions with appointment as a chaired professor. Among the highest recognitions the university can offer to a member of its faculty. And CB is one of these exceptional scholars. And in a few minutes, Dr. Er, Dean Arjong uh, Arsad will go into more detail about his accomplishments. But just to say a few things about CB, he's a world-renowned world expert in business strategy innovation with an emphasis on increasing business and social value. His important work focuses on a, how a company's approach to corporate so social responsibility, sustainability, and other social initiatives, as well as its identity and reputation, can influence consumer and stakeholder, react stakeholder reactions, relationships, and market value. Named twice to Business Week's prestigious outstanding faculty list, his vast body of research is reflected in more than 100 published articles and two books. He's very prolific. CB is recognized as one of the top cited researchers in the field by Thomson Reuter and Google Scholar, with the latter reporting over 23,000 citations of his journal articles. As well, his expertise is eagerly sought out by companies from around the globe, from AT&T to Hitachi, and from Procter & Gamble to Unilever. And so it's very fitting that this distinguished colleague, that his distinguished colleagues have recommended him for his, this appointment. Now, it's our custom, custom in the Academy to present medallions as an age-old form of recognition for those who have made exceptional scholarly contributions. They represent the high esteem in which we hold our colleagues. So at this point, I would like to invite Dean Assad to join me, along with Dr. Bhattacharya, as we officially recognize his appointment as the H.J. Zoffer Chair in Sustainability. I can find this beautiful medal. Thank you, Provost Cutt, and thank you, Pitt Business faculty and staff. Thank you all for being here. And also thanks to members of the broader Pitt community for joining us on this special day. Today, I have the privilege of introducing our world-renowned speaker, C.B. Bhattacharya, who holds our H.J. Zoffer Chair in Sustainability and Ethics, and is also Professor of Marketing and Management at the Joseph M. Katz Graduate School of Business. At this point, I should recognize that the H.J. Zoffer mentioned in the chair is present here with us. Jerry, good to have you. And uh, a number of people contributed to the Zoffer chair, and some may be in the audience, and I would like to welcome them as well with gratitude. 
Now, Dr. Bhattacharya is an expert in business strategies that enhance both business value and social value. His research and teaching focuses specifically on how companies can use under-leveraged intangible assets to strengthen stakeholder relationships and drive firm market value. Examples of such intangible assets include corporate identity, reputation, corporate social responsibility, and sustainability. Dr. Bhattacharya has published over 100 articles, and as the provost mentioned, has over 23,000 citations per Google Scholar, has served on several editorial review boards, has served as guest editors of special issues of leading international publications. But to really see the other side of CB, I'd like to mention a few pivotal events in his life. Um, it starts, for CB, it starts at home in Kolkata with his relationship with his father. CB averse that he would not be where he is today without his father's role. His dad was loving, caring, but also very insistent, in particular about doing well in school, in a country that is extremely competitive when it comes to higher education. This persistence motivated CB to excel in high school before attending St. Stephen's College, one of the premier Indian schools in Delhi, which was a few hours of flight away from his home. This was the first time he was away from home, and he loved it. <laughs> but since his father's head office was in Delhi, his dad suddenly found numerous reasons to visit that office every two weeks or so. CB graduated summa cum laude with a finance degree, and to this day he credits his father for his success, which is why we are live streaming this event for his parents to watch. Of course it is, absolutely. Of course it's 1.30, I think, a.m. in the morning uh, in India, so uh, there will, they will certainly get the recording from us as well. His parents had a hand in another major development in CB's life, which had to do with an arranged marriage, but an arranged marriage with a twist. When CB was pursuing his PhD at Wharton, he'd been told by his family about an exchange student from India who was also studying at Temple in the same city, and his parents were insistent that they meet. Indeed, they did meet. Um, CB asked her out, this led to a friendship, but not a romance. And eventually, this friend introduced CB to a roommate, an exchange student from Germany. That <laughs> person is here today. Her name is Elfrida. We're very pleased to have Dr. Elfrida Fursik here. Elfrida uh, uh, also teaches at Pitt, and also to have Felix, uh, uh, your son, uh, present. It's a wonderful family. CB started his faculty career at Emory University, conducting research on statistical modeling of supermarket scanner data. He then made a pivotal career choice, changing his focus to sustainability. This latter interest grew when he was teaching a market research class, working with students to tackle real world issues, partnering with close to 30 nonprofits and social class organizations throughout the Atlanta area. His presence at Pitt is due to this pivot that he made in his research interests. For his work at Emory University, he received the Emory Williams Distinguished Teaching Award in 1995, which is the highest teaching award at Emory University. That is one of the two awards that CB is most proud of. The other one is being named a Web of Science highly cited researcher by Thomson, by Thomson Reuters in September 2016, placing him at the top 1% of researchers in the business field. The next major event in CB's life was not pleasant, but also proved to be pivotal. On November 20th, 2003, at the age, well, at 2003, he was hit by a car. 
sometimes I've given, I'm being given too much information. <laughs> in the hospital for a su substantial period of time, and uh, true to form as a great teacher, only two weeks after the accident, he started teaching from the hospital. One was through a radio connection, and the other one was a smaller class, so they actually came to the hospital to take the class. This uh, accident, of course, also made CB think about how he wants to live his life to the fullest. I uh, was delighted to meet CB first in May 2016 during his job talk. CB's reputation was by then quite well known. I felt that he was the ideal person to establish and grow our reputation in the area of sustainability. After his talk, we went to a very memorable dinner and the rest, as they say, is history. CB's goal is to make Katz and Pitt a leader in sustainability. His plans for achieving that goal began with his idea to create a center for sustainability here at Pitt under some form of an organization which would bring together public and private sector companies in the area to implement sustainable business practices. He previously founded and built such a center at the European School of Management and Technology in Berlin. He also established the Sustainable Business Roundtable, a forum to discuss opportunities and challenges to mainstream sustainability practices within organizations, which has grown to include 25 multinational companies. He joined Pitt in fall of 2017 and though he has been here for only a short period of time, he's already made an impact on our school. One of his most rewarding accomplishments thus far has been teaching our executive MBA students in China. To get a feel for how his teaching was received, I talked to the students myself after his course was, was finished, and the feedback I heard was overwhelmingly positive. Going beyond academics, CB began, began taking saxophone lessons soon after his accident. And one of his fondest memories, I'm told, was playing a jazz tune called There Will, be Never, there Will Never Be Another You, dedicated to his wife, Elfrida, on her 50th birthday. He's also an accomplished chef, that I can attest to. <laughs> CB, we appreciate your accomplishments and admire your pathway to Pritt and to Katz. We're proud to have you in the Zoffer chair. The subject of CB's lecture today is small actions, big difference, leveraging corporate identity, responsibility, and sustainability to drive triple bottom line value. Please join me in welcoming Dr. CB Bhattacharya. I don't know if you guys have uh, ever watched a, a trailer that's kind of long for a movie, and after you watched the trailer, you felt that you don't need to see the movie anymore <laughs> because all the highlights of the movie have already been said in the trailer. Uh, I kind of feel the same way right now. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that uh, uh, Dean Assad would, you know, go into such nuances of my of my life. But uh, so let me see what I can do to pick it up from there and give you even more information into some of the topics he's actually touched on. Um, so, uh, that he had to unexpectedly travel, but I thank him, Provost Khad, uh, Dean Asad, Dean Zoffer, and uh, Elfride, Felix, and distinguished guests. It's, uh, it's, I'm truly humbled at this honor today. I mean, it's so wonderful to be here, and it's so wonderful that so many of you came out to celebrate this, this occasion uh, with me and, and my family and, and all of us. Um, it, really means, it really means a lot. Um, you know, I've been only one year in Pittsburgh, and in that short period of time, the fact that you know, I've managed, so many of you have managed to come, take your time off for your, out for your schedules is uh, really uh, a big thing. So, two weeks ago, I heard a talk from my colleague, um, 
Kate Lamberton, who's sitting here, and she said it during her talk that perhaps this is the one occasion if you say something untoward or, 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 or a little bit uh, you know, wayward, you're, not, you're likely, not likely to be fired. So <laughs> I, I really took that to heart. So, <laughs> so I figured that you know, I've spent all these years in academia and before that in industry. I think it's, uh, it's a fitting occasion to actually tell you about the twists and turns of my career, none of which I think were actually planned. And what I am today, actually there was no, there was no plan. So it's kind of go, you know, you go with the flow and things happen. And um, so I began my, my professional career back in India. So I've done this MBA from um, IIM, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, which is a, a very fine school, and the oldest person I know in this whole, in this whole setup uh, is Prakash Mirchandani, who happens to be in the audience today, and I'm very happy about that. I, I know him since 1983, which is, you know, kind of when I went for my um, MBA. But I graduated, and I got a job with a consumer products company by the name of Reckitt Ben Kieser. Now, some of you may know Reckitt. They make uh, products uh, like Lysol. You may have heard of Lysol uh, or Airwick. They make these kinds of products. But my job back in India in 1984 was to launch a brand of toilet cleaner in the Indian market. Uh, I know that sounds like fun, <laughs> <laughs> except that this brand was three to four times as expensive as anything else available in the market at the time. And to compound things, India is a labor surplus country, so most of the households at that time were not engaged in cleaning their, their own toilets. Right? There were janitors who would come and do it. So this was a real struggle for me. Go, okay, how am I supposed to do this now? So my vice president in marketing came up to me one day, and, and he's a very smart person, and he said, why don't you go talk to some prospective consumers of this product, you know, people, the target segment, those who would actually uh, buy this brand and find out from them kind of, you know, what their thoughts are and, and why don't you do some focus groups? I said, oh, you mean uh, I'll ask the agency, our market research agency to do some focus groups uh, on our behalf. He said, you can ask the market research agency whatever help you need, but you are going to moderate the focus groups. And he left a pile of books with me so this is how focus groups are done. I'd never done anything like that before in my life. So anyway, I had to study all of that. And I, and I did this focus groups, and I really had a lot of fun. It was profoundly kind of joyful to me to be able to speak to people and try to figure out kind of what's going on in their, in their minds and how we can actually translate that into strategy and, and, and action and so on. So lo and behold, we launched that toilet cleaning brand. It's a brand called Harpic. Some of you may have heard of it. And I'm very happy to report that it's the largest selling toilet cleaner in the Indian market today. Now this, I want to go on my obituary. <laughs> I want to be responsible for a lot of clean toilets. It's an underrated good thing in our lives. You only notice it when it's not. <laughs> so <clears throat> three years of brand management and I landed at the Wharton School, as the dean said, the University of Pennsylvania. And my interest in doing my PhD was to do something in the field of social marketing. How does marketing uh, help address social issues? But I didn't find that much of an interest in, in the department in, in something like that. And you know, we had to take a course in um, communication skills and presentation. Everybody had to go through that. And there was a kindly old gentleman who is to teach that course. So he took me by the arm one day and he said, son, if you want to graduate from this school, you better think about something that makes money because that's all what anybody here thinks about and cares about. So, oh, okay. So change of plans and I did my dissertation in the empirical modeling field of kind of, you know, with supermarket scanner data. So that was big data at the time. And what I did was I derived measures of brand loyalty and brand health, and all of that stuff. And I landed myself a job at Emory University. 
at Emory University, the first thing that I was asked to teach was market research. Now, if there was one thing I had learned from my brand management days is that you cannot really learn research sitting at the desk. You have to go out into the field. So I said, okay, I'm gonna send my students out into the field and what's the point of doing fictitious projects? Let them, you know, let's do some real world projects for social cause organizations, for nonprofits who are otherwise unable to afford such help. And so we launched this uh, kind of initiative and every, you know, uh, every semester we would get projects. So we did a lot of projects, American Cancer Society, uh, the Red Cross, Habitat for Humanity, you name it, we, we, we did it all. And it, it, um, it got some attention, right? I mean, you know, you, when you do something like that, people notice. So I also, I too kept a diary, much like, you know, you heard in the news in, in the past days that people have been keeping diaries from 1984, 19, <laughs> 80, 88 or whatever. So this is my diary from 1994. Uh, and I know it's hard to believe, but that's actually me. Um, you know, so business school program is doing all this crazy CSR, social responsibility stuff. And one of the organizations for which my students did a project was the art museum in Atlanta, the High Museum of Art, it's the premier art museum there. And <clears throat> the students did something that they stood outside, they did some exit surveys of visitors and members and so on, and, and, and uh, that was helpful. But then in conversation, the museum revealed that they had a deeper problem. And the deeper problem was that they were losing members at a high, quite, quite a high rate. So the membership churn was quite high. And they wanted to understand what they were doing wrong because the service that the students did, everybody seemed to be quite happy with whatever was going on. And so they approached me with a little bit of funding. Okay, do you want to do this project and try to understand this? So I didn't know, it's so, okay, I mean, you know, I'm a scanner data, I'm an empirical modeler. I mean, how does this fit all this museum stuff and, you know. So I talked to a few of my colleagues in, in the management area. And they said, well, you know, sounds like an interesting project. Why don't we just do it together and then we'll do it as a fun project. Maybe something will come out of it or maybe, you know, we'll write a case study or something. Okay, fair enough. So, so we started and, and of course, old favorite focus groups, back to the focus groups. So we did some focus groups with the members, just members of the museum. Said, so, hey, I mean, what's this membership all about? Why do you pay your money, you know, and what do you get out of it? And to our surprise, it was really not about kind of, you know, visiting the museum like 10 times a year or maxing out at the gift shop or any of that kind of stuff, but it was much more about things like, oh, it's an opportunity to support the arts, it's, uh, it's a place to belong. I mean, you know, we mentioned, we talk about it in cocktail parties and this and that. And, and so it was clearly like this sense of belonging that they had that seemed to, you know, be more important to them than the tangible benefits, if you will, that the museum was providing with the, with the, with the membership and which they were touting a lot with, with every appeal for renewal that they would send. And that opened our eyes to, and there's this literature that talks about social identity. So that as human beings, we all have a social identity. And that social identity in the olden days was about churches, it was about political parties, sports clubs. But in, you know, by the time it was the mid 1990s, cultural organizations as well, kind of that's what you derive as a social identity. So what we found is that and we did a follow-up survey after those focus groups. We found that social identity actually influences member retention in these cultural kinds of organizations. So what happens is that you identify with the organization, right? And so the first paper we published, and my colleagues, Hagi Rao, he's a chair professor at Stanford, now Marianne Glynn at Boston College, was about this understanding, this bond of identification. What does it mean to identify with with an organization. That's not the place that you work at. So the management scholars had been doing work on, on where you work at, but this was about kind of more in the marketing domain when you are kind of, you know, a customer, so to speak. And this was kind of fairly new in the marketing field and it's the only paper I would say, typically if my papers get published at all, they take about four to five years to get published. 
And this one was like 10 weeks from submission to acceptance, which, is, uh, which was you know, rather good. So I guess we were saying, saying something new there. And when we saw this happening in practice, I started asking the question, so what happens when you don't have a formal relationship? Like you're a member, OK, fine, I get it. But what, what if you don't have a formal relationship in an organization? Like you're just a consumer. Do you also identify with brands and, you know, kind of, uh, and companies in that, um, in that role? And the real world evidence would suggest, yes, you do, right? You know this? You all got favorite tattoos of brands or other symbols of pride that you want to kind of show your pride that, that you belong to a particular organization. But there was no work at that time articulating what this business was of kind of, again, this social identity that you can affiliate with a certain brand, you know, because you want to kind of um, display your values and the overlapping values with, um, uh, to, uh, to, to society and to your friends and colleagues. So we developed a framework, my colleague Shankar San and I, developed a framework to explicate kind of under what conditions does this identification happen, and then what do you get? You get some really strong things like customer loyalty, positive word of mouth, and these are things like marketers care about, business folks care about. So essentially, businesses would be wise to engender this feeling of, of identification. Going forward, the next question was like, oh, okay, consumers have emotions, members can feel towards museums, what about more hard-nosed people, like business-to-business -business people? I mean, you know, those who make rational decisions. Would they also kind of care about firm identity? And so there I teamed up with some colleagues and we studied prescription behavior of doctors. You know, they're rational people, should be anyway. Right? Um, would their prescription behavior be impacted if they had a better feeling about the organizational identity of one of the companies relative to, uh, relative to others? Um, and there, lo and behold, we found that, you know, keeping all else constant, a doctor actually prescribes more of a particular medication if they care about the company, about the company's identity, the company's image, much of which is also kind of transmitted through the salesperson who visits the doctor. So we developed an empirical model and explicated the uh, antecedents and consequences of such identification, and this was a study uh, published in the Journal of Applied Psychology. And then the next question became, kind of, oh, if people can affiliate positively with a company or a brand, how about a separation from a company or a brand? Maybe they can define themselves also by, via that separation. Right? Um, and it oftentimes happened that we kind of, we know what we are not. Right? So, you know, can say, well, I'm not sure if I'm a chef, but for sure, I know I'm not a handyman. You know, this much I, I, I'm sure. Right? Um, or, as Jerry Seinfeld very famously in a hilarious Seinfeld <laughs> scene once said, you know, <laughs> who am I kidding? I'm not an orgy man. I mean, you know, he said, look, okay, leave me out of this. So, se sense of separation can be definition, self-definitional. What better organization to study that sense of separation as well as the sense of affiliation than the NRA? So I teamed up with my colleague, Kim Elsbach, uh, who's also a management colleague and now uh, at UC Davis. And we studied and we published a couple of papers on this concept of organizational disidentification and how it differs from identification. And what we find is that identification is much more nuanced and disidentification is much more stereotypical. Okay, they are just bad. I'm going to distance myself. Personal experience doesn't play a role in disidentification, but it does in identification. Now, this area was getting kind of hot because consumers were, uh, or companies were latching on to specific values, um, like we are pro-gay or we are anti-gay or what have you. So I wrote a small op-ed for, for the Financial Times when this Baria Pasta, they, they, their CEO had made some very strong anti-gay comments uh, about five years ago. And this area, this whole area continues to blossom and, and it has kind of really caught a lot of people's attention. And this kind of transition, I will transition now a little bit to show you how this whole knowledge of identity and identification and 
uh, this identification kind of informed my, my, my ongoing research. So when I was still kind of trying to procure projects, I met this gentleman. His name is Ben Cohen, and he used to be the CEO of Ben & Jerry's. So he's the Ben of Ben & Jerry's. And we just met at a leadership conference, complete, complete serendipity. And I was like, okay, I was still procuring projects. Ben, you know, can we help you do something? And he said, you know, there is uh, uh, something that intrigues me. He said, you know, we have this ice cream, and we do social things for, uh, you know, for our farmers, you know, so we pay for fair trade, and we support the rainforest, we have environmental initiatives, social initiatives. He said, can you help me understand if what we do in the social and environmental sphere, does it help us sell ice cream? You know? So do consumers actually reward companies for their socially responsible behavior? said, well, I don't know, but I'm very intrigued because sales is something marketers are always trying to drive up, you know. But they never thought, we never thought of environmental attributes and social attributes as drivers of sales. We were always thinking of price, product quality, promotion, advertising, all of these kinds of things. So I said, okay, this is intriguing, and I'm, I'm going to kind of, you know, take this on. So more generally, the question was kind of, okay, if I create <coughs> socio-environmental value, will that drive my business value? And Ben Cohen, of course, was talking just about stakeholder reactions, specifically consumer reactions. And this is this upper right-hand quadrant where indeed this can happen. That's my sweet spot. So I kind of just mine that in various different kinds of ways. This is where you have profit, but you also care for the people. You also care about the planet. It's basically what we call the triple bottom line. And so I started, I, I tried to figure out kind of, okay, if we want to do this, figure out if consumers reward companies or not, it's got to be experiment. It's got to be an experiment. So I called up my uh, buddy from, from Wharton for my PhD program, uh, Shankar Sen, with whom I've written a lot by now. And we did some experiments to figure out under what conditions do companies, do consumers actually reward companies. And we found out that, yes, there are conditions. And those conditions, I know, depends on what kind of CSR issue the company is supporting um, and you know, the, what, what kinds of beliefs the consumer has, what kind of product quality you have, and, and, and all these kinds of things. So this was the start of the CSR. And, and the, the point that I want to make to link it to the previous research is that the main psychological mechanism that drives these consumer reactions is that identification or is that sense of belongingness with this company who's doing these good CSR things and I want to be affiliated with such a company. If that doesn't happen, then the rest doesn't follow. Now by now, you know, kind of I was gaining some notoriety for uh, my work in, in, in the CSR area and Procter & Gamble kind of invited me to join an RFP to, to submit an RFP they wanted to know what difference they were making to society and to, uh, and to the business by the $125 million they were spending on, on CSR at the time. And uh, I was lucky enough to, to uh, win the RFP. And then, you know, everything was all set. And I was going to go to um, Cincinnati, essentially, to discuss the specifics of the um, project and then there was a major life event that, that happened that Arjun alluded to, which is I got hit by this um, car walking down the street. And so it's lights out, basically, for me. And then when I kind of came to in the ambulance, just for that half, half a second or so, I really wasn't sure where I was, whether this was this life or this is the afterlife. You know, was, so I said very tentatively, I said, you know, where, where am I? half expecting, you know, St. Peter or, <laughs> or his Hindu equivalent to kind of come and embrace me and say, you know, the gates, <laughs> you know. So as the boy said, you're in an ambulance. You, know, you had an accident. Oh, okay. And then they'd like, so what's your, what's your name? What's your address? What's your phone number? They'd like to see if my brain was functioning or not. And I just gave them the answers. And, you know, by the third or the fourth question they had, I 
came up with a counter question. I said, you know, I have this really important meeting in Cincinnati next week. <laughs> Do you think I'll be able to go? And these guys, I think they're like trained to keep you calm. The, yeah, yeah, we'll put you in attraction. I mean, you know, no problem. <laughs> Little did I realize they wouldn't be able to walk for a year, I mean, let alone. So the folks from P&G actually came to meet me at the hospital and we kind of developed the program there. Anyway, I digress. Um, so the first project we did that PNG was interested in, does this help, does the CSR actually help recruit employees? You know? And it was a very interesting project. They had a project um, like uh, Ohio State University. It's a big recruiting ground for them. So they recruit from Ohio State. And they uh, said, you know, we make a million dollar gift to this center that kind of helps underprivileged children. Can you help us understand whether kind of, you know, this gift, does it have a spillover effect as a recruiter? Kind of do students have a more positive perception of P&G as a result of this? So we actually did a, an experiment where we did a before and after study with the $1 million gift as a real world stimulus. And then we were able to, to actually assess the impact of that gift. And for sure, we found that those who were aware that P&G actually had made that gift and they really wanted to help society, had more positive perceptions of, of, of the organization. And then we also did focus groups with employees of P&G to find out whether they were kind of being, um, you know, engaged, more engaged with the company as a result of the CSR and so on. And, and on, on, on average, we found indeed, you know, there were some who weren't happy, but there were some who were happy and they were indeed more, more and more engaged. So that was one part. The other interesting study we did for P&G was this thing called Expressed Healthy Smiles. So P&G runs a program where they train underprivileged children to take better care of their teeth. These are poor families, oftentimes immigrant families, um, low income, low education, uh, primarily Spanish speaking. So what we did there was we actually studied the parents of the children and talk to them you know, through focus groups, through a survey, which was basically after the kids went through the program, we did kind of a post-intervention um, kind of control versus the test, the test versus control comparison to see if the program was having any impact. And we learned some amazing things from, from this experience. So this was uh, my, my doctoral student, Shuilis, uh, dissertation as well, and we learned that through this program, these kids were not only doing a better job of brushing their teeth and flossing their teeth, the functional benefits, but they also had amazing psychosocial benefits. They had more self-esteem, they were smiling more often, they were making more friends. And as a result of that, their parents were really happy, and their parents said, the least we can do is to support this company who's doing these good things for us. I mean, the, they knew that the company also had an agenda of actually marketing toothpaste to them. And they did, because these immigrant families, I said they were primarily Hispanic, they came from Latin America, where Colgate is very strong. So Crest was also looking on this as kind of, or P&G rather, was looking on this as a creative way to, to get into this target segment. Mm -hmm. And it was working. We found that those who went through the program, didn't matter what they thought of Colgate beforehand, they were really impressed with uh, Crest and and, and brand switching was, was, was happening. So at this point came the next question, okay, does CSR actually help employees do a better job of serving customers? So you've talked individually about CSR helping employees, CSR helping customers. What about that interface? And we did find indeed CSR makes employees more customer oriented. This is another doctoral student's dissertation where we got data from frontline employees. And it turned out that CSR is the icebreaker in the conversation. When you talk to somebody, you can actually say, oh, you know, I volunteered last weekend, I did this, what did you do, et cetera. I mean, you know. And this got mentioned in The Guardian. <laughs> and I show this because the only time in my life, I guess, um, Tim Cook and I were mentioned in the same, same article, Tim Cook, CEO of Apple. Um, <laughs> And Tim Cook says, not all about the bloody return. So it's not, somebody asked him a question in the shareholders meeting, and he said, it's not all about the bloody return. Social programs also impact employees. Um, and at this point, folks were saying, OK, this is all nice and good. Can you show us any market impact? 
Does it, have, does it actually drive market value of a firm? We said, okay, what to do? So this is Fortune's kind of 1,000 companies. They do a survey every two years, uh, or every, yeah, every other year. And what we found by doing that study where we took data both from Fortune's CSR ratings, but we also took data from um, CRISP to get market value data and CompuStat, et cetera, we found that, yeah, you can have market impact, but under the right conditions. And one of the main conditions we found was that, well, if a firm has low product quality, then it doesn't matter if they do better on CSR, their market value is not really impacted, which makes sense. But a firm that does have high product quality, their market value is indeed impacted by doing CSR, which makes sense because the fundamental job of a company is to make good quality products. Nobody is going to you know, cut you slack just because you're socially re responsible and at the same time you're giving them poor, poor products. So these were a couple of papers that I did with uh, Shui Ming Luo, who's at Temple University. We also looked at risk and idiosyncratic risk and we found that firms that are doing well in CSR <coughs> have less risk because their employees are happier, they're more consistent cash flows, and there's a variety of reasons one can invoke. So all of this put together became this book, which I published with colleagues in 2011 on how stakeholders actually react to CSR initiatives. Now, I made one central observation in doing this book. The central observation is that I visited companies like P&G, General Mills, Timberland, a variety of companies. And I found that the CSR officer or the sustainability officer was a very fine person, but he or she was also a very lowly person. He or she did not have a seat at the proverbial table, you know, did not participate in strategic decision making. And this observation was paralleled by conversations in my executive education class. I was doing a lot of executive education. And I was asking people kind of, hey, and by now, the language had changed more to sustainability. Hey, are you kind of engaged? What about sustainability? And they would always say, well, it's really important, but I have more important things to do. We have a department that takes care of this stuff. Now, how can saving the planet and its people be relegated to one department of the organization when it really has to do with every possible operation and function of the company? So this problem, I call it some, this, is, this syndrome is someone else's problem. This is someone, it's, everybody says it's someone else's problem. Right? So small companies say it's the big company's problem. Big companies say it's the government's problem. The government says it's other countries' problem. We saw that, don't forget. Yeah? It's not our problem, it's not the US's problem, it's you know, other countries. So what are we to do? We've got to fix this. So that was kind of the, the next challenge that I kind of took on. And in the meantime, we'd moved to Berlin, and I founded this Sustainable Business Roundtable with zero companies when I founded it. This is the zero. <laughs> and so now it has like you know, 24 companies. And all good things must come to an end, so this November will be kind of, uh, I cannot be in two places. So <laughs> um, got to say goodbye. But what I tried to do here is I would create these meetings to show the interface between sustainability and other functions, like sustainability and HR. Right? How can we get every employee to think and act like a sustainability manager? Or sustainability and marketing. Kind of how do we get our consumers to reward us for our sustainability performance? On and on and on, right? Procurement, investor relations, strategy, all of it. And everybody would have to bring another person from their organization. That, like, no, no, no ifs or buts. Bring another person, and we duke it out for 24 hours. We just discuss, debate, peer-to-peer -peer learning. So we were recording these meetings. I was learning something from there. But I also decided to go out. Right? So I want to understand how sustainability is embedded. So I cannot just sit in this conference room and learn. I want to visit factories. I want to visit head offices. And so I spoke to about easily well over 100 folks in the CEOs, C-suite, senior managers, and regular employees. They are the most fun. You know, you get the real dope from them, not the, not the company line. Right? 
So all over the world, visited headquarters, branch offices, executive education sites, and I had my round table. So the learning, essentially, kind of let me give you one highlight of one meeting, and then I'll take you to the learning. So one highlight was my interview with this gentleman. This gentleman is Paul Coleman. He's the CEO of Unilever. Unilever is one company which arguably has done uh, a lot in the sustainability uh, area, thanks to Paul, who came on as CEO in, in, in 2009. So I got an interview with him. And um, very learned man, very, very, very articulate. And towards the end of the interview, I said, you know, Paul, why don't we write something together? I said, oh, a book? You know, I don't want to write a book as a sitting CEO, et cetera. So, no, it doesn't have to be a book. It can be something small. So we wrote two articles uh, together, uh, one in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, one in MIT Sloan. I'll just give you like 10 seconds from each of these. So in the Stanford article, we talk about the importance of purpose. It's like you cannot have a business without a purpose. And in today's environment, if you say my purpose is to maximize shareholder value, that's a bit antiquated. Right? So why do we do what we do? This question, you know. And we said that companies must ask this question. And I'll, I'll revisit this later. In this MIT, we, we presented six uh, kind of biggest stumbling blocks to, to adopting sustainability and what to do about them. And one big stumbling block, for example, which I find quite interesting, is like sustainability. CEOs think that, well, it's change management can fix it. So we'll, we'll bring in Accenture or we'll bring in some big consultant and it's a change management. But the reality is integrating environmental concerns, social concerns into our daily lives, into our business is not, is not change management. It goes to the philosophy again of why the business exists in the first place. And it involves every person in the organization. Everybody has a role to play. Nobody, you should not think just because my job is to put the lights off or on or do mail that I cannot, you know, help in the company's mission. Everybody can help. So that's the thought that we were trying to bring through these, through these articles. And then I published one article in the Harvard Business Review on my own on to kind of, okay, how do we make this everybody's responsibility? And my kind of one insight, the main insight, is that you know, ownership is the answer. So there's a literature on psychological ownership, on how we don't need to own things, but we can also own ideas. And the idea of working on sustainability can be, can be that sustainability is my own, can be such an idea. And this is what I saw in the finest organization. So I went to a Unilever factory in the middle of nowhere in India. But there was so much, so much pride that the employees took in fixing Every little issue there was, you know, how to harvest rainwater, how to do this, how to do that, they were all champions. You know, it was not somebody else's job in that organization, even in, in that factory. Okay. So how, how do we get there? So I have developed a framework which is, going to, which is the subject of a, of a book, which I'm going to present to you now in, in, in very brief. And the path to sustainability ownership, I want to say that there, basically there are three phases, incubate, launch and entrench. What do we mean? And each of these steps is, uh, or phases is broken down into a couple of steps, two or three steps. The first step is again, you have to, to contour the domain of sustainability, which leads to that question of purpose. Why do we do, why do we do what we do? And for example, BASF says that we create chemistry for a sustainable future. So, there's going to be 9 billion people on the planet. How are we going to deal with it? Electricity company is not in the business of selling electricity. A car company is not in the business of selling cars. It's in the business of providing mobility. So unless they kind of think about what it is that they actually do and move away from sales, none of this is going to happen. So the first step is to do that exercise, kind of, you know, to contour the domain of sustainability. The second step is to concretize. Well, what should we focus on? So here is the fight for, like, this is a conflict mineral. This is a mine in Congo. And you know, the kids are kind of digging and, and getting these conflict minerals for your cell phones. So a cell phone manufacturer or Apple might be very interested in dealing with conflict minerals. That could be a priority for them. On the other hand, 
a cement company might have to think about greenhouse gas emissions as a priority. So what are your priorities? Otherwise, if we don't, as I heard in a quote from a CEO, if you don't focus, then you don't do anything. Right? So then everything is important, then nothing happens. So you've got to focus. Top two, three, four things. So that's the incubation phase. And then you launch it to the company, to the rest. So this is with the between the executive and the leadership team with input from employees, but still not in the entire organization. The phase two is the launch, where you just launch this sustainability program in the company. And then you've got to entice your employees. You've got to seduce your employees, kind of, OK, hey, this is important. It's your job, too. So Marks and Spencer, one company I studied quite a bit, what they do is they do happy hours with their employees. Kind of a nice concept. Mm -hmm. Where they take their employees to pubs. You know, in the UK, it's very common to go to pubs after work. They go to a pub after work, and they actually talk to their employees. So what are your children going to do? You know, so if we live like this. So we have uh, one point. We are already doing 1.5 planets using 1.5 planets worth. We will be using three planets worth by 2050 if we don't change, etc. We have to do something. So they would take them to the pubs. There are other companies that take employees to the front lines to see how their job actually makes a difference to people's lives. There are many, many ways. But you've got to do that. Create opportunities, give them incentives. You know, that's the selling job. Essentially, you're selling the, the idea of sustainability. And then you have to enable them. You have to empower them. They don't know what to do. Everybody doesn't know. Everything is not as simple as putting off a light. I mean, there's like eco-efficiency analysis. There are you know, softwares that you have to run. Materials that you have to buy, you have to know what to do. So training, systems, structures, trainings, goals. Goals are very important. So Unilever has seven very clear goals that they want to hit. And once you have the goals, then you know kind of what am I going towards. So you have to enable and empower your employees. And in the third phase, which I call entrench, there are basically three, three steps. The first thing is to kind of demystify the progress that people are making. You know, you've got to don't, most organizations, they don't communicate anything. Okay, we're doing something, we're doing something. But if you have like, you know, this kind of in your face kind of messages, which I've seen in many companies, kind of, <laughs> this is the progress you have made through your efforts. Isn't that amazing? good to know? I mean, that gives me a sense of ownership that I, yes, I want to do more on this because I'm, I'm doing a good job. Then enliven is like, okay, you have to keep fresh. You have to keep things fresh. Otherwise, it becomes a flavor of the month, and people kind of you know, die off. So Enel is one of the companies I work with a lot. It's an electric utility company. And they celebrate failure because they say, if you don't fail, then you're not trying hard enough. So employees vote in who's the, which project is the best failure, and that person and that project is awarded. I was actually in Rome to watch this go down. And the CEO's there, and there are 500 people in the audience celebrating failure. Go figure. And, and the last step is, is expand the sense of ownership. You know, when you have a house, and it's not just enough that your lawn is pretty, everybody else's lawn also must be pretty around you, right? So, you know, so that the neighborhood kind of looks good overall. That's kind of this concept. So you have to collaborate with competitors because this is the round table for sustainable palm oil. One company cannot stop deforestation. Unilever alone cannot stop deforestation. It has to partner. So there has to be PepsiCo, there has to be Coke, there has to be this, that. So therefore, we create the round table for sustainable palm oil. And that's the most, I think that's the most evolved stage of, of kind of this whole idea of, of Sustainability when you can put sustainability in the pre-competitive phase right? and go from there. Um, so bringing all of this together, so I'm writing, I'm writing a book. You know, um, Dean keeps asking me, when is it going to be done? So, well, you know, things take their own time. Um, and I have as well a journal article that we are working on, the journal marketing, waking up to their senses finally. Uh, they have a special issue, better marketing for a better world, so I'm working on an article for that. And, and hopefully there'll be more to follow because there's lots and lots and lots of material. I mean, it's, it's, it's all over the place. So um, thousands of pages of transcripts. Right, so what should we do at CATS? And there's a third pasture and the final pasture of my talk. I'm sure you want to get to the reception. 
Um, what, what should we do? What we, so as Dean Asad mentioned, I was brought here, I was brought here under this notion kind of, okay, we want to do something in the field of sustainability. And uh, um, okay, that sounds good. That sounds kind of right, right up my alley. So I've spent one year now, and I just want to show a few things that we've done and, and give you some food for thought for the, for the future. Um, so the first thing we did was actually formed a sustainability committee at the business school, and I thank my colleagues. You can see uh, Fritz and John. Kate used to be there, now she's no longer. Um, and all of you have been very helpful. So the first thing we did was we have a new web presence. And thank you, Janice, uh, to you and your team. So there's a website that is all things sustainability at CATS will be kind of underneath that, including faculty who do research in the area, the courses that are offered in that area, speakers, and you know um, <coughs> other news and, and so on and so forth. So, so that's one thing we did. We've launched a speaker series. I'll show that to you. We have a sustainability certificate. I'll show that to you. And then this big idea in my head about creating a sustainable business forum. So we've had three speakers come through in the past year. So Jeffrey Sachs, some of you may have been there at his talk. He and I actually met um, at this Sustainable Development Solutions Network meeting in Berlin. And you know, I invited him to come to Pittsburgh. He agreed. And only one day before he came, I got a call from a gentleman in the political science department, my good, now my good friend, Michael Goodhart, who at that point sounded panicked. And he said, what are you doing? He's coming and giving a talk at my center. I said, no, he's coming to my center. <laughs> Turned out Professor Sachs had kind of, you know, accepted two invitations without telling the folks <laughs> at Pitt that he was giving two talks at Pitt during his own visit. I guess he was hoping he would never be found out. <laughs> but that wasn't to be. Um, we've had the vice president of IBM. He's the lead man of sustainability at IBM. And Andrew McElwain, many of you know him uh, from the Heinz Endowments. He was, uh, he, he was there as well. And Ed Freeman is, is coming at the end of November. So this is, you know, people, students, Faculty, we can all rally around that. It's another good thing to do that signals that this is something, something we do and it's, it's, uh, it's valuable. Um, brand new certificate in sustainability. We just have got it off the ground. It's been approved. So this is for our graduate students, right? Just the MBA, the full-time and part-time MBA students at CATS. It takes 10 and a half credits of which Four and a half credits are, are compulsory, and then you have six uh, credits to take as electives. Um, and the electives, basically, that's what I wanted to point out, that we have courses at Gespia on sustainability. We have courses at the engineering school and the Mascara Center on sustainability. All of these courses, our students will be able to take, and vice versa. Students from there can also come and take you know, these courses that we offer. Um, and, and so it's a way to, to do something for overall for Pitt as well. Our next step here is that we want to have a full recognition on the transcript. Right now, graduate certificates don't have this. And we also want to have add more electives. I believe the undergraduates actually have a uh, university-wide certificate in, in, in sustainability, right, Audrey? And we have wanted to go there with our graduate students as well. But you know, small incremental steps is uh, is better, I think, in this regard. So let this go off the ground. We'll see how people, uh, how people have dealt with it. Um, and then, of course, I want to have a center. I want to do something with practitioners and industry and so on. So this whole idea of external engagement. So in the past year, I've tried to build bridges with several organizations, several individuals that I have been fortunate to come across. First is kind of I was made a board member of this wonderful organization called Sustainable Pittsburgh. And we have members from Sustainable Pittsburgh here in the audience. Thank you for coming out for your support. And I've learned a lot from them because they are actively working in, in this area, kind of in multiple organizations in, in the Pittsburgh area. Um, and shout out to our brand new executive director, Jolette, who's sitting in the audience. I look forward to working with you. Um, 
Then I've given a few talks. So I gave a talk at this CEOs for Sustainability. And we have some of the CEOs who actually come back to listen again today. So I guess the talk must have gone reasonably well there. <laughs> Um, I gave a talk at the Dean's Board of Visitors, and lo and behold, we have some of those vi Dean's Visitors as well back with us. It was a very interesting experience. I gave a talk at PNC Bank, and we have some folks from PNC Bank here. And all of this is to kind of assess needs, kind of what can we do in this area that hasn't been done already. Um, I've met with the city officials. Uh, I don't know if Grant made it. Grant, oh, Grant Irving is the Chief Resilience Officer of the City of Pittsburgh. Uh, sitting back there, and the city of Pittsburgh just got a $2.5 million grant from the Bloomberg Foundation for, for, for dealing with climate change. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg is going to be in Pittsburgh, I believe, on Sunday. Correct me if I'm wrong. He was here this past Sunday. Oh, he was already here this past Sunday? I'm late to the party. <laughs> I thought he was coming this Sunday. I was excited. <laughs> so the city plays an important role. I met with the Allegheny Conference, another important uh, party in Pittsburgh. I keep hearing these names over and over again. I met with the f uh, foundations of the Heinz and the R.K. Mellon folks, and, and they are quite excited to do something in this arena. And um, I've also had a meeting with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, this uh, organization that builds smart cities and such. So they've already worked in New York, they worked on Baltimore, Vancouver. You're thinking of taking tips from them in, in terms of how, you know, what can we bring to, bring to Pittsburgh. So I've also, another very important input in this is the chancellor, is our very own chancellor. And I was, I was very impressed as to how much he knew about sustainability when I had the conversation with him. And it looked like he was definitely interested in the area and wants, to, wants us to do something uh, at this university in, in this, in this uh, particular domain. And my overall assessment is that there is, there is a need for a business-centered opportunity, kind of where kind of businesses in this region do need to push their sustainability agendas forward. They would not be what I would say kind of perhaps you know, the, the, at the top, of the top of the heap yet. Um, but business cannot go it alone kind of in this particular region and because the public sector also has, has a role, an important role kind of to, to, to play in this. So, so, so what I see as my next challenge is not just to bring companies together, but rather just to create or try to create uh, a sustainable ecosystem in, in the Pittsburgh region. So where companies will work together with the nonprofits and the uh, public sector organizations. So there will be private sector companies as well as public sector companies. So your Duquesne Electricity and people who I have not actually engaged with myself yet. Uh, but your water, where does your water come from? Um, <clears throat> why is the air quality so bad? These are questions I keep hearing a lot. And these are not questions I've dealt with in my past life. But what would be the fun of recreating your past life again? So might as well go out on a limb and try to do something new and see what, see what happens. I'm very grateful to the uh, Burke Center, to Audrey and the Burke Center for agreeing to incubate this effort. I mean, we've already got a little bit of space in Senate Square, and we are gonna be writing some grant proposals and, and trying for some funding. And this is an inclusive effort, so I just want to say there's the city and, uh, city and regional officials, <coughs> there's academia who can help a lot, there's NGOs, there's foundations, there's think tanks. All of these are, 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 are inputs. But we have to have a clear idea about who are we actually working with. Because if, if everybody is the main actor, then I don't think we will get a whole lot done. So we have to kind of say, OK, there is a purpose for the forum. The forum is happy to take input from different parties, but then, you know, kind of we we go from there. Um, October 23rd, 2019 is a Wednesday. <laughs> and if you wish, you can mark your calendars because that's going to be the inauguration of the Sustainable Business Forum. Exactly one year. You better write that down, Leslie. <laughs> you know, because you're going to be doing a lot of the work. <laughs> so, um, 
But, but that's, I think, the idea of being able to work. So what I had in Berlin, the center, it was pan-European, so there were different companies who came uh, from different parts of Europe, but they were mostly companies, and we didn't really have this kind of idea that we would have input kind of from the public sector, input from the city, input. But I have met all these marvelous people, uh, you know, uh, like Grant Aurora, of course, is uh, an expert in this area, our new chief sustainability officer at Pitt that we have uh, hired. She's going to play a key role in this. Um, and so my sense, my, my sense overall is that, you know, together we can. Because this is, our survival is at stake. What more, I don't know what more can be more important than our survival, our children's. I mean, you know, my son is already, he was reading the newspaper and said, well, this is supposed to happen in another 20, 30 years. I mean, you know, that's basically in my, in my lifetime, you know, so, and, and that's the reality. So if a 15-year-old starts getting worried about what's going to happen, you know, 30 years down the road, that's not a good thing. And maybe we still have enough kind of in us as a community, as a collective to to do something, and I believe that these issues are only going to become more and more important in the next 10 years. I mean, we are in the right in that sweet spot, and I think we do have a tailwind right now, even to make kind of you know make these issues a bigger part of the school, a bigger part of the university, a bigger part of the city, and, and a bigger part of our lives. So, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. So um, would, I think we have a time for a, a couple of questions. Sure. If you'd be willing to take a couple of questions, that would be great. <laughs> sustain or not, I don't know. That's for the future and that's for the next uh, academic director to kind of figure out. But, uh, you know, I'm seeing them through till, till, the end of this, till the end of this year. I'd already agreed last year that I have a one year kind of handover and transition period. Um, and that transition is really important because there are some companies that I'm talking to here who are my members there. So a prime example would be BASF. Um, so, I met BA, this CEO of BASF in the, in the U.S. Um, in this uh, very interesting uh, economics of mutuality conference that I went to a few weeks back, and you know I, I think we can pick them up. So, so, uh, so I cannot comment on what the future is going to be. It's still very much there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, John. Hey. Um, so, what's going to bring if anything the region's big polluter? Um, I don't know. Grant, what will bring them to the table? Why would they care to come? Carbon tax. <laughs> Carbon tax. Um, I was going to say alcohol, but I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, if they don't, uh, the, the likes of U.S. Steel, uh, if, they, if they don't come uh, to the table, then we are not really doing so. And that's where I would have to rely on uh, people, um, you know, who know more than I do about the region, about the companies, about these industries to take their help. Jim? Isn't what you refer to in the development stage is building a culture in an organization? A culture in an organization that would focus on sustainability. You didn't mention the word culture, but it seems to me that that's consistent with Oh, you're absolutely right, and and thank you for listening attentively. <laughs> um, it's 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 all about it's all about the culture. So, and uh, you know we, we know the cliched phrase at least that we know kind of culture is strategy for lunch, but that's actually what Paul Pullman told me himself that you know this culture beats everything else he told me, 
And not, not that you don't have to have strategy, not that you don't have to have systems and, and measurements and this and that, but yes, it fundamentally boils down to kind of, yes, this is, this is what we do, this is who we are. You know, so it comes down to identity as, as, as well, for sure. Shanti, hey. Yeah, I mean, it's, of course there's greenwashing. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about that. But if, if you are able to, so we didn't talk, what I didn't mention in the interest of time, is that there are two routes via which sustainability creates value. I call one the direct route and the other one the indirect route. So the direct route is like, you know, when you take an action, you know, to uh, print two sides, I'll give a very simple example. You know, so immediately you kind of you're, you are saving on paper, which is a precious resource. You're saving money, on, so you get that right away. But then the, the indirect route, so greenwashing really comes in in the indirect route. So are stakeholders going to reward you? Are stakeholders going to reward you for what you are doing in the sustainability? It is only in that little part, and and if you actually look at the benefits from the direct route and the indirect route is, you know, 80-20 or 75-25 at best. Most of the gains that you're going to get are from insulating your factory or, you know, coming up with a new process innovation that's going to lower greenhouse gases or this or that. There, the opportunity for greenwashing doesn't come because you're just fooling yourself. I mean, you know, who's going to believe you? So only, it's only in the stakeholder reaction part that the greenwashing can actually come in. And there, the research, or my research shows that consumers sooner or later, they, they figure out and then they don't support those companies. I've been to plenty of companies, inside plenty of companies, and interviewed employees where the companies have the best websites, the CEO speaks a perfect sustainability talk, but the employees know that it's all too confusing and nothing really is going on. So in that organization, that employee is not energized to, to work more, kind of, you know, in fact, feels demoralized. So there is, you know, enough evidence to suggest that kind of, you know, maybe when it comes to uh, consumers, they might get tricked. Even investors will not get tricked. So because they actually look at kind of, you know, hard, they want to look at the hard data. And, and, and make decisions. So I would not worry, you know, I, I know it's, a, it's an intriguing topic, but I think at the end of the day, the bottom line benefit is much more from just actually doing the right thing than, you know, worrying about kind of who's not doing it because that's, they're ultimately not gonna, you know, get, get the rewards of, of being socially responsible. One more. I'm curious to hear oh. you think about a couple of recent high-profile examples where large corporations projected an image of corporate um, social responsibility and experienced um, you know, strong backlash. Examples that come to mind are uh, Pepsi and Nike in dealing with issues of race in the United States and Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And there was tremendous pushback, even though I think many people would agree they would be yeah, I mean, in some of those cases, actually, I think it goes back to this earlier thing I was talking about, kind of when you want to take definitive stances, you know, kind of, you know, kind of, we are, we support this and we don't, so, so it's not motherhood and apple pie causes, but kind of something very distinctive. Um, 
I actually thought, I mean, so for Nike, there was backlash, but I believe the sales numbers suggest that they have actually benefited quite a bit. You know, now you could say, well, is having kind of Colin Kaepernick, I mean, is that being socially responsible? Well, they are going, they've, they're premeditatedly into this particular, in this particular direction, hopefully with the knowledge that they're going to lose part of their you know, uh, consumer base. The consumer base who's kind of really weirded out by seeing this ad or who's creating that backlash, you have to be, you, whenever you take such a stance, you have to be willing to, to forego the base who's, who's not going to come along with you. So Nike no longer is this kind of you know, universal company that everybody is going to look on uh, very, very favorably. So there will be people who will love them, and there will be people who, who disidentify, so to speak. OK, would you please join me in thanking?